All right, let's walk through a couple of the internal structures of the heart. So this is a nice, nice model. Uh, just because I'm using it doesn't mean it's the only one that's going to be on the quiz or anything like that. I guarantee you there'll be more than one heart on the quiz. Uh, but this is a nice one. Uh, you'll likely see it on the quiz, and I think it's a good one. It photographs well. It's a good model. Um, all right, so when we take a look from this perspective, uh, first, actually, let's bounce over and take a look right at the first picture we were at. So, uh, as always, you need to always orient yourself. Uh, there's a number of ways to do this, but the thickness of the ventricle walls is a really reliable way to tell left from right. right. So, you've got this wall in the middle, which won't really help you much because it's in the dead center. But you really just want to look at these exterior walls. This wall is much, much more thin than this wall over here. So, this thin wall is likely going to be your right ventricle. It needs to generate way less pressure when it goes off to the pulmonary system through this semilunar valve here. Uh, so it doesn't need as much muscle to do that. Uh, if you look inside of each one of these ventricles, you'll see two different valves. So we're looking up into these ventricles. And so you see these valves here that are really, really simple, one unidirectional, one-way valves. They're just kind of like a door that only opens out. Uh, so blood is allowed to flow towards this valve and can flow out of the ventricle but not in. This is called the pulmonary semilunar valve because it's connecting to the right ventricle which goes out to the pulmonary system. Uh, the exact same type of valve is found going into the aorta. Kind of obscured here, but it's right down here, right where the cursor is. And that's another uh, semilunar valve, but we call that the pulmonary, sorry, not pulmonary, aortic semilunar valve. And so functionally, very same thing. They, they open up to let blood go out and they close to prevent blood from coming back in to the ventricle. So these other more fancy valves, hopefully you got a chance to appreciate these uh, on the actual dissection because they're pretty complicated valves. Um, they are unidirectional like all valves, but they take actual uh, muscular work in order to make these valves work. And so the valves themselves, they're in general called a mitral valve. Um, there, this one here specifically can be referred to as the bicuspid because it has two flaps or two teeth, cusp meaning teeth. And then over here, it's a little harder to see, but see, I eh, can't see it much better, but in the right ventricle, you've got what's called the tricuspid. Um, that's fine. I, it's not too, there's no consequence or no real importance to the fact that one has three and one has two, so I don't really like that name as much. I like AV, atrioventricular valve, because it tells you where they are. And so these are valves that are between the atrium, which is up in here. can't see it really, but it's up through the valve, here and here. And this valve just prevents blood, when, when either one of these ventricles is contracting, it just prevents blood from going back up into the atrium. These valves have these cords, these white cords hanging off of them, and they're called chordae tendinae. They're just like tendons. In the model, they're actually not connected to these little projections coming out of the ventricle, but like right here and probably right here and maybe behind it more, there's actually what are called papillary muscles. They're big projections of myocardium. And on the real dissection and on a real heart, the way you find these is just by following the chordae tendinae down into the papillary muscle. And so you've got your AV valve. For this one, it would be the left AV valve. So this is, again, why it's so important to be able to tell left and right on a, on a heart because a lot of the naming that you're going to be using, to be perfectly specific, you need to include left or right. So these are both AV valves. This is the left AV valve. The chordae tendinae come right off of that valve. And they're not connected in the model. Um, but in a real heart, they are connected. And really, these papillary muscles are just the highest peaks that kind of come out of this what's called trabeculated inner surface of the heart. So hopefully you got the valves down there. Definitely have left and right. And we've gone over a few of the structures. Uh, I'll point out a few things that are coming to mind here. Obviously, the apex of the heart here is the point. It's a little counterintuitive because it's lower. And often, the apex is the highest point. But in this case, it's just the pointier end. The apex is down here. The base is up here where all of the large vessels are interacting. Uh, also, trabeculae, um, I used that term just a second ago to describe the invaginations or all these ridges that are on the inside of the heart. And so the heart is not a smooth, open, 
you know, container. It's not like a glass jar. Um, it's actually really, really wrinkly, has a lot of different infoldings in it. Uh, those infolds are called trabeculae. So the big, big infoldings are the papillary muscles, but all the other ones, those are trabeculae, and specifically trabeculae carne is what these are called. Um, also, this light tissue, you saw this on your real dissection, but this light layer on top, that is just your endocardium, and you see it layer, it coats all the internal surfaces of the heart, and this is actually continuous with the layer, see here, we're getting into the aorta, this endocardium continues into the uh, aorta, and it's just providing nice smooth what's called laminar flow, meaning that there's no spinning or turbulence in the blood because that kind of turbulence can lead to coagulation um, and other clotting issues. So you have a nice smooth layer of endocardium all the way throughout the, throughout the heart. Inside of the blood vessels it's called endothelium, but it's the same stuff. All right, so what else is left here? We've got an atrium flapped open over here. So let's go to the other picture and we'll take a look inside of this atrium. So I'll let you think to yourself which atrium this is. Is it right or left? So pause the video if you need to think about it. And so really what your eyes should go to um, is the really get, get oriented with this ventricle again. Here's the skinny wall. Here's the atrium. So we're dealing with the right atrium because of that. And so inside of the atrium, you're going to have these really cool looking uh, little ridges. And these are similar to the trabeculae carne. These are actually called pectinate muscles. And this is simply the muscle of the atrium. And so the atrium does provide some contraction in order to force blood into the right ventricle. And so it has the pectinate muscles that provide that force. This little lip hanging off of the edge here is called uh, the auricle of the atrium. And they're on both of them. You can only see one now. These actually are continuous. They're part of the open space, which is within the chamber of the atrium. But when the atria are deflated, sort of, or not full of blood, they form this kind of slack and this extra surface that hangs over the edge. It kind of looks like an ear, and so they give it the name Oracle. Let's see, anything else on this picture? Uh, well, I mean, always be able to just con from the point of view of the concept and knowing the blood flow, know which vessels are going to be emptying into the atrium, and really it's the superior, and you can't see it here, but it's also the inferior vena cava. This little depression right here is in a, an adult human, it's called a fossa ovale, um, oval fossa, and so you guys all are familiar with the term fossa, it just means a shallow depression, and you find these in what's called the interatrial inter septum, and this is just the wall that divides the two atria. And so in fetal circulation, the blood actually comes in through the inferior and superior vena cava and bypasses the right ventricle. It doesn't go there. It actually jumps right through this foramen ovale. And so foramen ovale are only found in the fetus, whereas in us it closes right around birth. Um, and we actually just have this leftover, kind of a scar actually from from this tissue. And so it's a, a nice thin little area that you can actually see on the real hearts. Or at least feel, depending on your dissection. So here's a view of the atrium on the, on the left hand side here, and there's the auricle hanging down. Remember the atrium is a chamber, the auricle is a structure. And let's see, what else do we have? All right, so switching to another view here, we're just kind of rotating around. Again, here's an atrium. The oracle is easy to see right there. This is our left atrium. It's not open for us, but it exists right here. Here's the left ventricle. Uh, this is the pulmonary artery or pulmonary trunk actually coming out of what would be coming out of the right ventricle. And the left ventricle here has these red indicated vessels. These red vessels, if we rotate again, you can see here's where we were just looking. And actually from both sides, you have multiple vessels coming into this left atrium here. And so the left atrium is receiving blood, oxygenated blood, but very low pressure oxygenated blood. So these are still called the pulmonary veins uh, because a vein is referring to the design of the tube, not the, not the, the actual oxygenation of the blood. So those empty into that left atrium. That atrium is going to enter through the atrioventricular, specifically the left atrioventricular valve into the left ventricle, and then we go back here. This very, very strong left ventricle is going to boost the pressure of that fluid. When it contracts, 
the papillary muscles will pull down on the chordae tendineae, which will close this valve so that blood does not get forced up into the atrium. Instead, the blood goes out this passive semilunar valve, the aortic semilunar valve, and it flows out the aorta and goes systemically. So that's pretty much it. I think I've talked long enough. Um, hopefully that helped you just run through some of the basic features. I didn't. This wasn't an exhaustive list. There are other things you need to pick out, but those are just kind of the quick and dirty ones. Hopefully that helps you out.